Thank you very much for having me here. I feel very passionately about this subject matter. So if that starts to show every now and then, please give me a, a, a little grace because uh, I, I feel it's very important to take a big picture view of anything, especially something as messy as healthcare. And I believe that those of you who are involved in informatics have a very particular role that could dig us out of a bit of the hole that we find ourselves in in healthcare. So uh, conflict of interest, I have none to report. The uh, learning objectives, which will roughly be our agenda, is I, by the time we're done here, I, that you can recognize healthcare as a complex system of systems in the socio-technical realm. A lot of polysyllabism there. Uh, describe quality in a systems context. So uh, we're gonna look at a quality concept that's accessible to every single person in your organization, not just the ones who understand uh, statistics. I want to illustrate and encourage you to take a, an enthusiastic view of how informatics, clinical informatics, can be so critical in improving the quality of healthcare as we know today. And I want to introduce the concept of an informatics pause, very similar to the surgical pause that really saved a lot of lives and limbs in, in the surgical realm. So we're told to start with why, and I want to start with why I'm even up here. And this is a good illustration of that on two different fronts. First of all, it's a picture on the wall that's crooked. I don't know if any of you are like me, but when I walk into a room and I see a picture on a wall that's crooked, I have to fight myself not to go up and straighten it. There's just something in me that wants to set that right. And in healthcare, there are a lot of pictures that are crooked on the wall, and it's going to take all of us working together to get those pictures right. The other uh, part of this is what the content of that picture is, and this is actually a picture uh, of me taking a broomstick in Weir Canyon, not too far from here as a matter of fact, and trying to coax out to play a couple rattlesnakes that are under a rock outcropping there. And uh, I can assure you that no animals or people were harmed in the making of this picture. Uh, but I did get someone actually to poke his head out and say hi to me. And the, uh, the moral of that story, hopefully, is not that I'm crazy and shouldn't be listened to. But there's things that we need to go poking around and find out. So there's value in things that we wouldn't think to look. There's, there's places that, that have some things that we should re-examine. And that's what I hope to do today, is encourage us to re-examine some things we've walked by all the time but with a little bit new curiosity. Uh, as is in the, in the program, there's a problem statement, and we've heard already this morning, there's only a small fraction of the data available to us that's being used in healthcare right now, and it's only gonna get worse. It's gonna get more and more, what petabyte of information I think we, we, we found out uh, at, on the average person. And at the same time, we've got more and more demand of we need to make data-driven decisions. And so the obvious, but perhaps not the right conclusion, is just build a pipeline, turn it on, done and done, right? I don't think so, and I think it's important that we don't just let that happen. I think that you and clinical informatics will have a critical role in building that pipeline and governing it properly. So let's start with first recognizing healthcare as a system. I like to start with a quote that's very well known in the software development world. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. And so uh, we need both theory and practice. And those of you who are practitioners know the, 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 the games played between academia and those who actually are boots on the ground. We like to point fingers at each other. The theoreticians uh, we make fun of, they, they, we say they overcomplicate the simple, they can't see the, the trees for the forest. If I hear one more theoretician tell me, if you really think about it, I'm gonna scream. And in popular lore, there's the internet uh, story of the King's Toaster. If you don't know it, look it up or I'll talk and tell you after lunch. It's, it's a great stab that computer engineers make at computer scientists. But on the other side of the ledger, practitioners get made fun of by academians that they oversimplify the complex. They pretend a Gordian knot's just a misunderstood shoelace. They're stuck deeply in the mud. They can't see the forest for the trees. Hey, let's not overthink this. Have you ever heard someone say that before? And this is where we get the blind man and the elephant analogy. And so individually, they're a problem, but we need both of these. We need that sensibility of what's actually happening in real life in the practitioners, but we also need that underpinning of the theory behind it. And that's because the theory helps us do that why. If we know the why behind what we're doing, we're going to do it better because that why will shape the what, the where, the when, the how, even the who. And in order to have a good understanding of that why, 
we have to understand a little bit of the theory behind what we're doing. So I'd like to start with some systems theory. And I know this is gonna freak a few of you out. Wow, systems theory, that's pretty esoteric. And I ask you not to panic because after the first two or three hours, you'll start to see the relevance. So just, just bear with me here. A system has input and output between which something happens all for a purpose. We can take a break there because that's the end of chapter one. That's all we're talking about. We're looking at a conceptual model of what's going on. We have something happening going in, something happening going out, and we're just we're, we're trying to create a conceptual model uh, to illustrate that something is providing value. The system's purpose typically involves adding value. And whenever we're looking at a system, we want to ask ourselves, what value does this add? I was having some conversations this morning that, that professional organizations like HIMSS or conferences such as this are faced with the question, what is the value they're presenting? It's great value, but we've got to articulate it in, in a sense that makes sense to the people that would want to come. What value could this be adding? That's, that's something we want to understand in every part of our lives, every part of our work lives, because we need to be able to deliver value in order to get paid. I'm addicted to food, clothing, and shelter. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm not gonna go in a 12-step program against it. I'm gonna to continue to be addicted to food, clothing, and shelter. But in order to get that money, I need to provide value. And models help us understand what it is that's trying to be done and the value that is gonna come from it. And it's just a, it's a conceptual abstraction. It doesn't have to be a scary concept. It just means we have an idea of something that's sort of big and gnarly and fuzzy, and we just put something together that says, it sort of works like this, so we can think about it, so we can explain it to other people, and so we can get our, our, our arms and legs wrapped around it. When we put in to get putting together a model, we're trying to do three things. We're trying to explain the past and present, we're trying to predict the future, and we're trying to make what we want to have happen. That's why we, that's why we think about models, and models have limitations, okay? Uh, we, we can't get everything we want of a model, but it's an important start. So models are just tools. Don't have to be scared of them. They're just tools to help us handle the big jobs, handle these very complex things like healthcare delivery, which is big and complex. But we have these tools that can help us look at it. Now, models don't have to be messy. This is a model of the solar system as we looked at it once upon a time. Uh, we, we, we could observe very readily that the Earth was the center of the solar system because we're standing here and the sun's going around us, right? That was an early model of the solar system. And it actually did a good job explaining the past and present, predicting the future. Tough to leverage the desired, but it became problematic when we realized there were other planets running around. And so this model had to give way to the heliocentric view that we understand right now. The reason I want to put this together is that this professional society, of which I'm a member, tends to have a model that is similar in its uh, inaccuracy, shall we say. That it's easy if we've grown up on planet healthcare information technology to believe that planet healthcare information technology is the center of the universe. But the good news is we're not alone because another professional group of which I'm a part believes, since they grew up on planet process, that process is the center of the healthcare universe. Now, obviously, just by the, these diagrams, you can instantly see where I'm going with this. At the hospital, the healthcare, the patient is what's at the center of this. And uh, even HIMSS itself, in their first, uh, first generation CP HIMSS uh, manual, uh, prep preparing people for the certification, said, look, it's not just about the technology. It's people, processes, and technology that all have to work together to what? Deliver value. So this is the gospel according to HIMSS. We're not violating, we're, we're not going at, at any too far off the range here. We, we want to look at all of these things together. So even those of us who are in the technology realize that's not the center of the universe. It has to work with the people and the processes. And the model that I happen to use, it, there's lots of different models. This is not the only, this is not even the best. I like a five-part model where I look at the culture of the entity, the organizational structure, the training, those are the three 
people parts, as well as the processes, what is it we're doing, and of course, the tools and technology that we know so well. The point of talking about this as a system is that all of these things have to work together. If we look at, say, just a healthcare information technology by itself and we ignore the other things, we can optimize the healthcare technology at the expense of the others and perhaps at the expense of what we're really trying to do, which is create value for primarily our patients, but there's other stakeholders in here as well. I would submit to you that this diagram is the real healthcare information and management system. So with that put together, that technology doesn't just exist by itself, but it has to be working closely with the people and process. What does that mean for quality? Now, several of you may be involved in quality, and, I, and my hat's off to you, I'm not taking anything away from you, but the, 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 I wanna make quality accessible to every single person in every single organization. And that's sort of difficult with the uh, views of quality that we have right now. So I'm gonna put forth some perhaps heretical views of quality that if you chew on it a while, maybe you can think, hey, I'm actually supporting what I'm doing. Because quality is what? Is it just an arcane esoteric alchemy that is dependent on high priests? Some people would use that as a model. And, and, and I've heard it said, I'm glad there's a quality department because now I don't have to worry about quality. That's their job. Um, is quality a process? a position or department? The hint is the red X as I put in front of you. Uh, I'm gonna claim that quality is a cultural value and a commitment that experience will meet or exceed expectations. That's, what, that's a definition of quality that I believe everybody can use throughout your organization. I just did the same thing. And, and so my quality meter is just a simple scale. Does the experience of the transaction meet or exceed the expectations of that transaction? If it does, it's satisfaction. If it really does, it's delight. And if it doesn't, it's disappointment. So if we think of it that way, and we're just thinking about the scale tipping back and forth, or for those of you who are math people, what do you do to, uh, to deal with the equation? If you wanna ensure that experience is greater than or equal to the expectations, well, one thing is manage the expectations. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about that, but, but bear in mind that part of the problem that we in healthcare face are unrealistic expectations. We are asked to do some pretty impossible things by patients, by providers, by payers, by the government, by the popular culture. And so managing those expectations to avoid disappointment is going to be part of the job of delivering quality experiences to our many stakeholders. But the biggest thing that we can do in the short term is improve the experience by looking at what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how well we're doing it. That is how we improve quality, and that has to be applied at every interface throughout the system. It's not just the patient dealing with the hospital, but I'm gonna pick on Mary Beth here, she says the front row, and I'm gonna say, Mary Beth, I can't turn in my report until you give me last week's figures. I'm disappointed because I expected those figures by now, my experience hasn't been that I've got them by now, and therefore I'm disappointed. And there's a couple different ways that could play out. She, she could say, well, idiot, it's on your desk. Oh, okay, then that, that's on me, you know? Uh, or, no, we said I'd give it to you next week, that's on me also, I had, I had invalid expectations. Or she could say, oh yeah, I was tugged in other directions, I'll get that to you immediately, adjust the experience. Just that little interaction for, with us in the very bowels of the hospital could ripple through eventually somewhere else in the system. And if we catch it early, if we harness that disappointment early in the process, we're going to have a better chance of the overall delivery of the hospital or wherever we're working doing what we want. And let's, so let, let's take the training wheels off for a second. This, friends and neighbors, is what you're dealing with. Uh, right here, 
I'm calling the healthcare delivery system. This is a hospital, a doctor's office, a clinic, whatever it is. This is the entity that's responsible for being the boots on the ground delivering healthcare to a patient. So let's say a patient walks into the hospital, the clinic, the office says, I want a flu shot. And the patient can't get a flu shot. Expectations were not met, experience was less than that, the patient is disappointed, that's a quality problem. But why did it happen? It could be that, that on intake, the intake uh, person did not correctly enter the, the name in, and by the time it was realized they were closing the office, it could be just a front office thing that they screwed up and, and couldn't take care of the patient. It could be that who's ever in charge of the pharmacy uh, ordering the, the vaccine didn't do their job, or maybe they did do their job, but it's still sitting on the dock because someone else didn't unload it. Or it could be because the pharma company uh, had an eight week uh, vacation and so they're behind in what they're doing. Or it could be that the government said, hey, we're not sure about that batch of vaccine. Let's just put a hold on every single vaccine for the next six months. Anywhere within this incredibly messy system, one thing could happen that results in this poor patient not getting what he or she wants. And so what I want to underscore is that patient experience of poor quality could happen anywhere within this messy system, either between the hospital and all the various other entities that have to work together in this network, or deep within the hospital itself. And so therefore, patient experience and health care quality is every single person's job. It's not just the department or the position, but every single person doing whatever is responsible for quality. I think this is an important thing to think about because in healthcare itself, we are transitioning from a mindset of treating illness to promoting wellness. We're, trans we're trying to walk away from intervention to prevention. And that uh, let's imagine that a patient walks into a, a, into a healthcare facility with a broken leg. We put a cast on the leg, we give them crutch, and that externally gives them strength until their bones heal and they can walk on their own again. If they can never put aside those casts and crutches, it's hard for us to say that we've really succeeded as healers. I would like to suggest the same thing in healthcare as an entity, as an industry, as a process, as an enterprise, that we are patients of ourselves and that we do need episodic intervention and externally imposed structure because there's a lot of things that we need to fix and we need, need to get our house in order. But at some point, we need to restore an inherently healthy state so that we don't need external interventions. I would argue at some point, sorry, we won't have quality departments because they will have done their job. They, will have, they will, will have performed themselves out of an existence and they will get everyone else in their organization to realize quality is everybody's job. That we, we will have a lot of these things change when the organization as a whole inherently, intrinsically, internally does what it's supposed to do. And to me, that's a quality system. A quality system is not a tack on supervisor saying, hey, make sure you don't screw up. A quality system is a system of inherently high quality. And I think that's what we want to do. I think that's the kind of thing that is going to give us what we, what we want. So how can we improve the inherent quality of the system in which we find ourselves working, no matter where you are, whether you're in a hospital or a, a clinic, whether you're working in healthcare in the corporate level and, and, and an educational institution, what can you do to improve the quality of, of your venture? Harness that disappointment. I believe every time there's a bit of disappointment, like I was walking through my scenario imagining with Mary Beth, that's a check engine light. The same way in your car, the check engine light comes on and says, look, it's not a problem yet. You're not dead on the I-5 at rush hour yet, but you might want to have this hauled into your mechanic and get it taken care of before you are being reported by the traffic copter is the reason why it's backed up all the way to Pasadena, okay? So every bit of disappointment inside your organization or outside your organization is a check engine light that says, something didn't work the way it should, let's investigate that. Let's do something about that. And that requires a support structure. That requires a mindset. That requires a mechanism that, that you know, 
I have to be comfortable that I can go to Mary Beth and say, this is not what I expected, and I, I'm, I don't think I can do my job with what I'm getting. And that requires a culture. That's, a, that's, that's, that's not what we're taught to do. We're taught to suck it up, she does her thing, I do my thing, and eventually somehow it'll all automatically work out. I believe that we have to have a mindset, especially in healthcare, that says harness that disappointment and point by point say, that's not what I was expecting. Let's find out whether I was expecting incorrectly, whether you were delivering something less than, or whether it's, it's both. And we want to be able to adjust on either side of that equation. I believe a side benefit will be better, place, better workplace morale. It's a pretty big side benefit, but it's, it's gonna come from an atmosphere when we focus on what we're trying to deliver is that value. We all have an incredibly important role to play in delivering the value, and we have to work with each other in order to deliver that value. And some of that disappointment will be able to be resolved peer to peer. Sometimes it'll take uh, some sort of oversight committee that has to be handled by skilled people, and, and that's, that's a subject for a, a, another, another time. So in summary, I wanna say quality in a systems context is simply meeting or exceeding expectations. It's gonna be dependent on the quality that happens inside the system in order to get quality to the end user. It's better to be cultivated internally than forced externally. And that makes it the responsibility of every single person in the enterprise to make it happen. And it can be facilitated by harnessing all those moments when something didn't go the way someone expected it to. And so this is why I, I believe the crucial role of informatics comes in. Because I think informatics people are in a unique position to detect and to voice disappointment before it really leaves the healthcare enterprise standard, stranded on the side of the five during rush hour. I'm gonna start with the concept that we need more disciplined people in healthcare. And that's a word game because I'm gonna start with some disciplinary words. Uh, multidisciplinary is a word we hear talked around and in my mind, I like to think of it as that's able to wear hats. I can wear my engineer hat right now. I can wear my cl uh, clinician hat right now. I can wear my data scientist hat right now. I can change hats. That makes me multidisciplinary. And that's an excellent start. But as they say in the infomercials, wait, there's more. That from that, we go to interdisciplinary, which, is mean, which means we're able to wear more than one hat at a time. And I... I believe that is the heart and soul of informatics right now, that, that you wear more than one hat at a time, and we'll talk about why that's so important. But wait, there's more. If you act now, if you're among the first 100 callers, what we wanna go to is even beyond interdisciplinary. It's transdisciplinary. And this is where you're taking all your hats, you rip them up, and you sew them together in one new funky looking hat that you wear all the time. And this is where we're going in so much of the technology and so much of what's going on in healthcare and other places, that there are, it's not just mixing disciplines together, but there are new disciplines emerging that are composites of these. You can't really call them a mixture. Chemistry people, it's now a compound. It's, it's got new emergent properties from all these disciplines coming together. And I believe this is the future of informatics, that you have been interdisciplinary, but you're gonna find yourself going into a transdisciplinary area where it, it's, it's not this and that, but it's this and that all together. And you guys are gonna be particularly well positioned to do this because you already have that interdisciplinary background. We need desperately need in the future more and more interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary people in the workforce, particularly in healthcare, who are equipped with multiple skills and who are categorized by their deliverables, not by their skill sets, because that's what breaks down silos. And in healthcare, as in so many other place, uh, 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 situations today, the biggest single problem we're ha facing is a handoff from silo to silo to silo. We have all these subject matter experts that are a mile deep and an inch wide. And 
Sometimes I'll confess that's necessary, but more often than not, it, re it results in dropped batons. And we need more and more people that are conversant across those silos to tie them together. And that's where I believe clinical informatics really comes in because you're not just messengers. You're not just the Pony Express carrying the data from one place to another. You are charged with understanding the significance, the applications, and the implications of that data. Think of all the stuff that, that you touch or touches you. I mean, obviously, uh, clinical healthcare, information technology, data science, human factors, all the way through that list, all of that is woven throughout the fabric of what you're dealing with. Now, you're not going to have a PhD in all of those, but when you're talking about clinical informatics, at least a surface understanding of what these things are and how they all fit together is part of the job. And that gives you an incredibly important value-added position for decision support. Because this person says this, and this person says that, and the IT people say, well, this will cause us problems when we do the change management, and the clinicians say, but yes, we have to do this in order to get our bed sore rate below here, and someone else says, yeah, but patient safety worries about this, and patient privacy worries about this. Someone's gotta bring all that together in a way that allows a decision other than by dartboard. And so coordination across those silos, I think, is a value add that clinical informatics can really bring. Uh, this is just a shock and awe slide that uh, healthcare technology, and this is just a, a simplification of it, whether it's nurse call, the patient systems, EMRs, meds, telemetry, Evidence-based medicine, uh, you got a sponsor out there does the dashboards, alarm management, all that stuff together is in theory supposed to work together to provide value. But even that together is still part of the larger technology and infrastructure, say, of the hospital. And if we're really serious about how all this stuff needs to work together, we need to have a big picture view. Now again, boy, I got a that's three. At, at four, I, 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 I okay. So um, we don't all have to have PhDs in all this. That's the reason we have specialties, it, it, that the world is too big for any of us to grab a hold of it. But we have to be literate about how all these things fit together with one another because of the data pyramid. Uh, or some people would argue it's not a pyramid, it's a circular recursive. I'm, I'm not gonna worry about the geometry right now, but let's talk about what happens to data when it grows up. Data by itself has minimal value until we throw it into context, we validate, interpret it when it becomes information. Uh, analyze for patterns, it becomes knowledge. Applied to forecast and decision making, it becomes wisdom. Most of you are familiar with that progression, and again, whether it's a pyramid, whether it's a recursive cycle, whatever. Data has to grow up in order to be valuable. If that data is flawed, misinterpreted, poorly analyzed, or improperly applied, everything downstream is foobar. That's a technical term, by the way. So what do we do to avoid that? Clinical informatics can be the transdisciplinary expert and champion to ensure that the data grows up to be healthy and strong that it's reliable, that it's applicable, that it's actionable. Because it's, I, I, I have friends in clinical informatics who have been bounced from job to job because they've been hired as a magic charm. Hey, I got an informatician, or informaticist, depending on where you go, on my team now. Everything's solved, right? Now I'll just grab all this data, throw it over here, problem solved. If a clinical informatics person is doing their job, they're gonna say, but wait, that, that doesn't answer that question. That's what your added value is. And you're not gonna be replaced by a machine for at least three years. Uh, one of the, the, the fathers of process improvement, Deming, has a, fam has a famous quote attributed to him, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And there's a lot of validity to it. That's why we have evidence-based medicine. That's why you guys are all dealing with data. There's nothing wrong with that statement. It's just insufficient. Now there's another quote that is not as widely known, but hopefully a little bit more today, attributable to me. With incomplete, irrelevant, misleading, erroneous data, you're just another unguided missile. And the difference between those two is the quality of how well 
the people around the data do their job. So one of the things, one of the areas where this is important is in metrics. Now, this is not directly essential to informatics, but I like to use this as an illustration because we see it hit the wall so often. Metrics, if we want to think in systems theory, for those of you who are systems theorists, is system feedback. It's a reward and punishment of something trying to encourage or discourage behavior and driving the next state. The problem with metrics is the things that are most easily measurable, the most easily played with, aren't necessarily the most relevant things to what we want to have accomplished. And we all have heard all sorts of horror stories of unintended consequences, sometimes pretty bad, from not using the right metrics. And um, a couple of years ago, Liz Ryan and Forbes wrote an article entitled KPIs and Corporate Stupidity. Now, for those of you who don't know, KPI is a metric that's supposed to be all grown up, vetted, and, and with a bow in its hair. It's a key performance indicator. And she recounts story after story after companies are maximizing these key performance indicators and running themselves into the ground because what they're measuring and what they're thereby optimizing isn't necessarily what is really going to get them where they want to go. Uh, you got to be careful what you ask for with metrics. There's a lot of really cool things. If I had more time, I love recounting these stories. Uh, if, if, if nothing else, uh, uh, on Wikipedia, look up unintended consequences. And there's all sorts of lovely stories of what happened when people go in with good intentions and get the exact opposite of what they wanted because they didn't dot their I's and cross their T's. The, uh, and it, having teachers teach to the test or even cheat because we pay teachers based on how well students do on standardized testing is one that's most universally known. We don't care how well the student does on the test. We care how well the student is prepared for life. Gauging how well the student's prepared for life is a lot harder than feeding what the test score is. In healthcare, we are at a bit of a crossroads here that as we talk about accountability, pay for outcome, pay for value, there's going to be more and more demand for metrics. And it scares the living daylights out of me what that could lead to if we are not very, very careful. Because we could find ourselves going in exactly the wrong direction. Uh, there are situations right now where um, uh, doctors are not on the record, but informally choosing their patients based on how likely they think they'll be a success with that patient because they don't want to have a low patient results score. And so in the, the whole idea of Yelp for doctors was we're going to improve the, the, the medical experience, right? But what we're actually doing is we're making it harder for a certain class of people to get access to healthcare because they're seen as more problematic and I don't want them to bring my score down. We're already seeing some of these unintended consequences from metrics and feedback. And as people in informatics, it's going to be your job to say, wait a minute, what are we really wanting to accomplish and is this going to do it? And so that's why I want to talk about the informatics pause. I, I, I think this is something that this is a very early process in my mind. And so uh, uh, you know, a year from now, I may repudiate everything you hear in the next few minutes. But right now, this is where my thinking is. Uh, most of you are familiar with the concept of a surgical pause or a surgical timeout. That once upon a time, not all that long ago, people were getting the wrong arms and legs cut off in surgery. Now, as you imagine, this made some of them very unhappy. And it made some doctors and some hospitals sort of embarrassed about how did this happen. I, I went in for a tonsillectomy and I found myself with no feet. This doesn't sound like good practice. And so, one of the things that came out was this protocol, which basically, in my rephrasing, creates a time and space to harness disappointment. It was an, an, a time to elicit and to address unmet expectations and employs active, not passive communication techniques. And it's now part of the national patient safety goals. This is a requirement that what happens before these key steps, before anesthesia, the patient has to say, yes, I am John Doe. I'm here to have my appendix removed, and you have my permission to do that. Before the first incision, Everyone in, around the team introduces themselves, say, this is my role, and let's reconfirm that this is the patient, and this is what we all agree we are going to do. And before the patient leaves the operating room, again, 
Check for, we brought nine sponges in. I only see eight in the trash can. I wonder where number nine is. Simple, simple things. But it had to have a space created for it because there wasn't the culture up until that point where typically, just barely, typically the OR nurse, but doctor, there's only eight sponges. <clears throat> I'm a surgeon. And there had to be a, a culture change. There had to be a space created for someone to say, but the emperor has no clothes. And so, and it's been revolutionary. And it's so simple. And yet it's been so effective to create that space. And I would, I have to think intuitively, there's an opportunity for an informatics pause. That every time we're requesting, generating, supplying, or utilizing data, we want to verify what is the purpose of this data? Where is it going to go? What decisions or actions are going to be driven by it? And is this a professionally appropriate, relevant, and sound usage of the data? Is this really answering the question? So the purpose of the data, I'm going to go to alliteration for you. The provenance of the data. Where did this data come from? Is it, does it have a good history? Can it be trusted? Did it come from an FDA-approved source that was calibrated, or is it self-reported? Now, self-reported data, especially in the information uh, age, in the Internet of Things, patients wearing their Fitbits and stuff, we would be fools to discount patient-reported information. But can we give it the same reverence as something that's an FDA-approved instrument calibrated last week, run by degreed professionals? Protection of data. Is it authentic, accurate, available to unauthorized, uh, to authorized users, not available to unauthorized users? Is it reliable? Has it been backed up? So the purpose, provenance, and protection of data, the three Ps, need to be asked before we send some data through a process that could literally change someone's life. It's, uh, and, and some of you are familiar with the rights. And so uh, from a big picture standpoint, my first stab at the rights for, the, for data is, is it the right data? Is it communicated in the right way? Is it visualized correctly? It, has it been analyzed correctly? Have we drawn the correct conclusion from it? Have we presented that to the correct audience? Have we responded correctly to that? And have we done the correct follow through, follow up of that data? So the rights, you know, five, seven, nine, depending on which uh, system you go to, all this can be in the context of the informatics pause now, again, every time someone asks you what time is it, you don't have to go through this. But when we're talking about major projects, your added value in the informatics world is making sure that the right data is going to the right purpose. Be watchful for the pitfalls. We, talk, we talked about um, the, the geospacing and, and, and the significance. One of my favorites or anti-favorites, many years ago, I was watching a newscast and, and the talking heads said, in a landmark new study, uh, it was determined that people who floss live an average of three years longer than people who don't floss. So if you want to live longer, floss your teeth tonight. That was a data-driven decision. Now, they didn't ask the question of, was, is it correlation, coincidence, or really cause-effect? Is it possible that the kind of people who floss their teeth are also the kind of people who have more disposable income, better health habits, better access to medical care? I mean, there's, I don't even want to get into all that, but at, from the, the policy standpoint, but from the information standpoint, is it enough to say, let's mandate that everyone floss their teeth? Uh, we're going to have a new hospital-wide program that if I catch you not, not having floss teeth, you're going to be Dr. Week's worth of pay. Verification versus validation. For those of you who are familiar with FDA approval, you already know this. In a, in, in a thumbnail, verification says, was the problem solved correctly? Validation asks, was the right problem solved? Was the correct problem solved? And there's a corollary in, in, in the data world for that as well. Uh, and then the implications that are drawn. There's a, a wonderful Do uh, Dilbert comic where Dogbert, who makes a, his living by preying on people's stupidity, was pounding the drum that in this school system, half of your students fall below the median score. For those of you who aren't in statistics, that's what you would expect. That's what the median is with a halfway point where half above, half below. But the way he made it sound like, oh my God, we've got to do something about this situation. And so just because the data says something doesn't mean that we're going to draw the correct 
implications and therefore make the right applications of it. And again, that's on you guys to, to rein in the people that want to use the data as a, as a weapon to advance their particular agenda. Finally, I want to talk about metrics and scope. Uh, you can, everyone's familiar with having seen someone win the battle but lose the war because they did what was requested but not what was needed. Because they optimized short term at the, at the expense of long term. And uh, efficiency improvement has a bad, bad reputation for this same reason because it, for so, many, so long it was just a code word for we're cutting the staff. Proper scope, scope meaning where you draw the lines around where your problem is, lessens the likely you're going to screw that up. Now, I'm going to give a very simple example, again, very elementary, far below what you guys use, but it's, it's a nice, tangible thing. I'm going to talk about a nurse call system where uh, in, a, in a patient room, there's a pillow speaker that's connected to a patient station that ultimately goes through the, all the wiring and comes up at the nurse station. And in this system, we can say that the, the value or the purpose is pushing the pillow speaker button shall reliably and consistently initiate a call at the nurse station. That's pretty reasonable, isn't it? That's, pre that's, that's good, there's nothing wrong with that. The patient and the nurse are inputs and outputs to the system. And we can say this system is working just fine if when we press that button, the light lights up. Case closed, nothing to see here, right? What if we include the patient and the nurse as parts of the system. And now we're talking about a socio-technical system. We're not just talking about the technology, but we're talking about people and technology working together to what? Provide that value that the system's supposed to do. Now, our purpose statement is different. We say that we judge whether our system's working correctly or not by does it achieve the objective of the patient shall be able to communicate with a nurse reliably, consistently, and clearly within five seconds of initiation. This is a lot different. We could say, yeah, the button lights up the light. What else do we need to do? But if it's not accomplishing this, is it really accomplishing the purpose that we need it to? Because in theory, this is a communication system between the patient and nurse. And so by making the scope of our problem larger, we've created a different metric. We've created a different purpose statement that when we start measuring, are we doing our job, yes or no, we're starting to get a little bit more relevance in measuring what's really important. But wait, there's more. If you, again, think of that nurse call system as part of a larger system of systems with all the other cool toys you play with, then really the nurse call, its role is to support the larger clinical care system that ensures that patients consistently receive efficient, effective, responsive, and compassionate care, and the caregivers have the resources they need without going insane. At the end of the day, I would argue this is why you have the equipment that you do in the hospital. It's not to light a button. It's not even just so that the patient and nurse can talk to each other, but it's so the patients get what they need and the clinicians get what they need in order to give the patients what they need. And by drawing the picture big, by articulating the appropriate metrics, by focusing on what data is really important, you lessen the likelihood of being fat, dumb, and happy because all the, all the lights light when all the buttons are pressed, what more could you ask for? See what I'm saying there? Your value is seeing that larger picture and making sure we don't settle for the trivial the easy to measure and the easy to check off the list, but we accomplish what we really want, which is, in most cases, delivering value for the patients. We talked about AI, and we talked about uh, in a context of all the cool things it can do. Before we automate any process, and I've seen this, I, there's, a, there's a lot of dead bodies on, on this road. Um, before automating any process, Make sure it's the right process. Make sure it's the right data. And this seems like such an incredibly simplistic, almost insulting admonition. But I gotta tell you, time after time after time, hospitals, institutions of all sorts have found themselves in bad, bad trouble because all they did was repeat the rate at which terrible mistakes were made when the process was automated. And 
part of your opportunity, and, and dare I say calling in the informatics world, is to be that value add to make sure it's the right process, the right data, that the informatics pause is essential when developing or implementing or testing an automated process. That you're there to look across the silos, to take that big picture look and to say, before we turn this from a manual crank to a high speed motor, are we really doing what we want and need? And so, in summary, I want to just give you a rephrase of those, uh, of those learning objectives. Cultivate and utilize a big picture understanding of whatever you do, whatever your role is in whatever institution, understand it in the big picture. What value, what purpose are you to add and how does that help your institution deliver its larger value? For yourself and spread the news to everyone else about this qualitative view of quality, that as much as it is important to have the numerics crunched and be able to chart a progress from year to year, there's nothing wrong with that. But what everyone can do is say, do I meet or exceed the expectations put upon me? And if I don't, let's talk about it. Let's, let's nip a quality problem in the bud before it ends up as disappointing the end user. Recognize that you are positioned so well to go across those silos, to bridge those disciplines, to have that big picture view, because you touch so many of the different elements of this that you can ensure the proper applications and implications. And please, please, please keep coming to conferences, keep going to webinars, keep learning so that you're ever more wide and deep in what you can contribute to this process of oversight. And think about the informatics pause to lessen the likelihood that someone has data and triumphantly and confidently marches in the wrong direction with it. Data-driven dysfunction is going to be a big pitfall if we're not careful. So thank you very much. Uh, take some questions now.